So yeah, as Michael said, I'm Isaac Miller. Appreciate you all coming out. Uh, tonight, we're going to be giving an intro to GraphQL, or as I like to call it, the people's query language subtitle, If You Smell What Facebook Is Cooking. Uh, so what are we talking about tonight? I'll give you a little bit on my background. Uh, we'll dive into the history of GraphQL and some advantages that GraphQL gives you. Uh, we'll talk about Graphical, which is the dev tool built into GraphQL. Uh, gives you a lot of nice things while you're developing. Uh, we'll talk about the three things that you really need to wire up a GraphQL backend. That's your schema, and within that schema, root query and mutations. Then we'll dive into a demo project and do a little Q&A. So my background here, uh, before getting into programming, I was a touring musician and a radio DJ. As you can see there, uh, I did get to meet Ice Cube. He did not have a very good day, uh, judging by his facial expression, but he didn't use his AK, so we're all good. Uh, but what was in radio in music, as the microphone, as, that's my bad, just to be clear, uh, as a radio DJ. I will not blame any microphone. But yeah, while I was working in uh, radio and music, I found myself often doing sort of dev adjacent things. So going back to like the MySpace days, I was setting up HTML templates and then later on uh, at my radio stations uploading blog posts, uh, editing things within WordPress and, and at a certain point decided I wanted to get into coding. So I started doing tutorials on Codecademy and Udemy and stuff like that. And eventually I found Galvanize. Uh, about a year ago, uh, July 5th, it'll be a year, uh, I started in Galvanize's G30 cohort at Golden Triangle Campus. You will recognize that guy on the right, Michael Herman, the realist Python himself. Uh, while I was at uh, Galvanize before I graduated, I got to take part in the Denver Broncos Tackle STEM Hackathon, uh, sponsored by SendGrid and Full Contact. And our team actually got to take home Best Sports Hack, which was sort of this affirming moment uh, because uh, already I felt pretty comfortable in JavaScript, but I never really tried to dive into some new technology, especially within the span of a weekend, and get something good out of it. But clearly the Broncos thought it was decent. And then as Michael mentioned, after I graduated, uh, I became a member of the instructional staff at Galvanize. I was the web development resident, which allowed me to go through the cohort once more in a teaching role uh, with G43, who's graduating on Friday. So if you guys are looking for some good junior devs, I will definitely vouch for anyone in that cohort. Uh, but as I was nearing the end of the cohort, I got a job offer from Vertifor. Uh, we're new to town. If you haven't heard of us, we're a SaaS company uh, facing the insurance industry. Uh, but we actually go back to 1969. Uh, Vertifor was making agency management software in the punch card days of computing. And now we've got over 1.6 billion files in our cloud and 85 million uh, real-time transactions annually. So safe to say we definitely have big data problems and tools like GraphQL help us fix them. Uh, at Vertifor, we use Java, C Sharp, and .NET as our core stack. Uh, we've got a bunch of different products, uh, over 40 products. So we're using SQL and NoSQL databases all over the place. Um, and really just a bunch of tools and frameworks that get the job done. So some things are using Angular, some things are using React, uh, and exploring technologies like GraphQL is highly encouraged. If all that sounds good to you, we are hiring, so hit me up after the talk is done, and I can tell you how you can apply. We're hiring for all experience levels. Uh, sweet, I think I did my job for Vertifor, yeah? All right, let's go into GraphQL. So what is GraphQL? Uh, it was created by Facebook in 2012 uh, for internal use. You can imagine the sort of data problems that a company like Facebook has. Uh, and it's a query language that is specifically focused on API development. Uh, it's used by some pretty big players, obviously Facebook, but also GitHub, Pinterest, Yelp, a bunch of others. It seems like they're updating the company list on their website every single day. And all that's impressive, but who cares? Really, at the end of the day, RuPaul is always right. Uh, well, the reason you should care is there's a lot of advantages of GraphQL, namely that it allows you to traverse your database as if it were a graph, which is not to be confused with a graph database. Uh, but really, we'll dive into that in the next slide of what that kind of means. Uh, but at the end of the day, with GraphQL, your client can get many resources with just one request. So if we look at a very simple ERD, uh, maybe a database storing books and authors, you can imagine if I want like a show book detail page, uh, and maybe I want to show the book Capital. Well, Capital has two authors, so I have to query out uh, to the authors table, and maybe I even want a link to related titles, and since Thomas Piketty wrote economics of inequality, I want to query that book as well. So in just one simple view, 
I've got three, four, five queries. And you can imagine, this is a pretty simple page. Like, those queries can stack up for your client side quite a bit. And GraphQL gives you a single endpoint for all your data, which means not only are you getting uh, data from multiple resources, but perhaps just as important, uh, there's no overfetching of data. And you have to do very little client side manipulation of that data because you can shape the payload in your request. Uh, and all that, at the end of the day, means that GraphQL typically is more performant uh, than making multiple requests from your front end, especially on mobile devices. So in a mobile first world, GraphQL is a very useful tool. That being said, uh, the, the talk of all your resources in a single endpoint doesn't sound very RESTful, so some people ask, will it replace REST? Or because of the QL in the name, will it replace SQL? And to that I say, not so fast. Uh, now don't get me wrong, if you're building something from scratch, you could use GraphQL for everything in your database, and maybe that's the way you want to go about it. But if you already have a deployed REST backend, or you've got some, just some endpoints set up, maybe for something like auth, you can use GraphQL alongside those things, uh, whether if it is a deployed database, you can use Axios, or you can just have GraphQL live inside your backend and just make specific queries for your client. Uh, it works with both SQL and NoSQL databases. Tonight you'll see I'm using Postgres with Connex uh, because those get used so often with Node and Express. But as I was learning GraphQL, I was doing it with MongoDB and Mongoose, and honestly it works just as fast, and, and the syntax is pretty similar regardless of your DB type. Uh, and it's also language agnostic. So even if you're not a JavaScript person, I would guess, given that we're at the Node.js meetup, you are JavaScript people. Uh, but if you're not, uh, there are GraphQL libraries for basically any language that's getting used today. They don't have a Fortran one, but they've got most of the big languages. Cool. So moving on to graphical, you can see a little bit, maybe some of the advantages, and I'll definitely be using it a lot as I show the project here tonight. Uh, but on the left side, you can sample your queries, and on the right, see what sort of payloads are coming back from that query. Uh, they call it a graphical interactive IDE built into the browser. And what's nice is that beyond just being able to test queries and see what payloads come back, it actually offers syntax highlighting and has a documentation explorer. So if you create a new type, like tonight we'll create a type of user, once you refresh graphical, that user will show up in your documentation. So you can imagine, I don't know many developers that say their favorite part of developing is writing docs. You kind of probably want to write code. Well, graphical takes, or GraphQL, I should say, takes that part out of your hands. And you can just say, hey, Go to graphical, test out some queries, click on some of the types, and you'll see what data we're using with GraphQL. So as far as building a GraphQL database, you will need to have a schema. It's the one thing GraphQL needs because all the magic behind GraphQL comes from it having a typing system. So we'll create types for all of our resources, and then above that, uh, we've got both queries and mutations that are also types within GraphQL. Uh, and because of these types, it can scan everything that it knows about through a thing called introspection uh, and grab just the data you need. Uh, so the schema in GraphQL is an object that contains, like I said, the query and the mutation. It's literally just that. You can include some middleware, middleware if you want, but if you are just setting up queries in GraphQL, you could just have the query key and everything would be wired up. Uh, so for query, you'll see uh, the query object that gets passed into the schema, often called root or just query. I like to call it root query just because that makes semantic sense to me. Uh, but it represents all the entry points into our GraphQL backend. Uh, and so this is where all, all our resources get defined, as well as the ways you can query them. If you want to think about it in terms of HTTP methods, this is where our get requests live. But we might want to add some resources that's not uncommon, or update them, or delete them. So for that, we'll use a mutation. Mutations for any time we want to modify data. And so some people, if they're using GraphQL for something like auth, that might come in through a mutation because you are making a post request, and you need to do something different than what the standard user type is uh, by serializing a token. So you might do it through a mutation. Uh, and just like queries, uh, mutations return an object type. So that's nice, as I add something new, you can imagine, say, like a shipping form, there's 20 different fields. But to show that the actual order is going to ship, maybe I only need five or six of those fields. So I can tell GraphQL to only send back the fields that I'm actually going to use. Uh, so again, in HTTP methods, this is where your post, patch, puts, and deletes live. Cool. So let's dive into a demo project. Uh, so for this demo project, I was thinking Instagram's cool, but what if Instagram was only about pet pictures. So we're going to make Petstagram tonight. Should be pretty fun. 
uh, I'll be using, of course, Node.js and GraphQL because this is the Node.js meetup and it's a GraphQL talk. Uh, but I'll also be using Express, Postgres, and Connex. Uh, to look at a simple ERD of what we'll have going on tonight, we've got three major types, uh, users, images, and pets, and some join tables to help store some of this data. Uh, I've got a user friends table because I figure if I sign up as a user for the first time, maybe I want to see my friends and what pets they own so I can follow them directly. Uh, as you can see with users and pets, I have those pet followers like I talked about, as well as pet owners because as I upload my own pet pictures, I want to be able to tell Petstagram where those uh, pictures belong. And then finally, in images and pets, I figure users will probably want a profile image, but since we're about pet pictures, we're not going to be storing multiple profile pictures for users, but we will uh, for pet images, and I want a way for a splash page just to show all the awesome animals in my app. So that being said, uh, I think I'm going to do a little bit of coding. Yeah. Cool. So I'll open up Atom here, and the terminal. How is that every for everybody as far as font size? Good? Now here's the thing. I didn't care that much, but I needed a water break, guys. So yeah, I snuck it in. Uh, all right, cool. So we've got a very simple express boilerplate here. Um, we just tell it what port it's going to listen to. Uh, and then spin up the server. I've also included just one RESTful route just to be able to show that my server is on and it's working. Uh, so I'll spin up my server with Nodemon. Cool. And in a new tab, probably bigger than this, uh, using HTTP, I'll just go to localhost 5000 slash pets. Awesome. So I've got Looks like overall uh, eight pets in my database, so that'll be a good jumping off point. I've also got migrations and seeds for uh, all the tables that you saw in the ERD. But this is a GraphQL talk, so let's get into making some GraphQL stuff. I'm actually, I'm going to spin up the server in this tab and move to another one. Cool. Is that still good for everyone? Yeah? Sweet. So we'll check out to step one, which is just where we define our schema within Express. So as you can see, uh, it's just an endpoint, just like pets, uh, but GraphQL, that is where all of our data is going to live. And we're going to use the Express GraphQL uh, middleware to tell it to find our schema. And that graphical is true, because we're going to want to use that in development. So up here, I just brought in uh, Express GraphQL, and that's how I got access to that middleware. Right now, though, if I go into graphical, which is just going to live at localhost 5000 slash GraphQL, and refresh it, um, I can try to query uh, stuff, but already it's saying, uh, is this big enough? Should I blow this up, too? Cool. Uh, it's already telling me, it's kind of an interesting warning message. All right, so schema must be an instance of GraphQL schema, but also it mentions that uh, we want to make sure that there are not multiple versions of GraphQL installed in your node modules directory. That's kind of crazy already because I talked about how there's different language versions for GraphQL and already the introspection's working where it looked around the app and said, oh, this is a node app and maybe the issue is that we have multiple instances of GraphQL in node modules. We don't. Um, I purposely just had uh, nothing in my schema yet for step one. So let's check out the step two. and create our root query. So now in our schema file, I'm bringing in GraphQL and connects just to be able to talk to my database. And then I use a little ES6 structuring just to grab uh, the GraphQL object type, string, int, schema, and list, just to let it know uh, that whenever I use those keywords, it's going to be coming from GraphQL. Uh, so just in case uh, you don't use a lot of destructuring, that's all that's happening there. Uh, but let's look down at our root query. So we see that I define it as a GraphQL object type, and within that, it's got fields. And each one of these fields in the root query is going to be a way that I can query my database. Right now, I've only created a user type, which lives above this root query. And so I have two different queries, one that'll grab all my users, and one that'll grab a single user. Uh, I define a type in each one of those uh, arguments that come through. So for a single user, we'll just pass in an ID to grab that user, and then a resolve function. So the resolve function is important both in your queries and potentially in your types because it tells GraphQL where that data is going to live. 
it'll know how to parse through the columns in there if you tell it that that's what fields are in uh, that table, uh, as we've got up here with like ID name and email, but it still needs us to know how to go grab that data. Uh, similarly, in, in my user type, I will eventually add fields for a profile pic and for pets in a later step once we have those types uh, available to us, but for now, I've just got ID name and email, and those already exist within that table in my database, so I just have to tell it what those types are and what they're called, but then friends, I actually need to be able to go into my user friends table grab all those associations, and then grab each user that it finds paired with that user ID. I throw a quick filter on it just to make sure that I'm not also getting extra instances of the user that I'm on, um, and I make sure that the user status is active because I figure for friends list, we want to have both pending and blocked available to us as well because it is in the social media world. It's hard out there. You might get blocked. Uh, so if we just want to query all users, and let's say right now I just want to get name from a user. So I'm going to refresh uh, GraphQL. You'll actually see me do that a lot tonight, uh, and that's only because this documentation explorer will only update uh, with, with the most recent version of the code, so it's not like NodeMon that way where it listens for changes in the code. But right now it knows that I have users and user. I can query a single, uh, a list of users, uh, and these are the fields that are going to come back from that. And I can also uh, get a single user if I pass it an ID, and those are the fields available to me right now. I'm going to close that down just for screen real estate. And now to grab all the users and just get back ID and name. Uh, once again, it can uh, know that this lives in the Documentation Explorer. So if I'm curious about the user's uh, query, I can just open that up and see what fields I can request back. So right now, I'm just going to grab ID and name. And there we go. I've got a bunch of wrappers, plus Beyonce. Uh, she lives in that world. Um, in my database, because that's kind of what I want to do, is follow wrappers pets, but you can use Petstagram however you like. Uh, that's just going to be my starting users. So I could query a single user with this syntax, very similar to what we had above, only now I'm going to pass in an ID in within these parentheses. But you can imagine, we don't want that to be hard-coded in for our front end. We want to be able to make that dynamic. So that's where we'll bring in query variables. And all we do for that is wrap it, uh, in this query wrapper, and we can give it whatever name we want. I just called it single user because that makes the most sense to me as we're grabbing a single user. But now I want to see uh, ID, name, email, and the friend's uh, names of this user. So we'll pass that in. Uh, it is JSON, so just don't forget to uh, wrap your keys in a string. But cool. So user2 is LP. I've got his ID, name, and email, and then he's friends with Killer Mike, Childish Gambino, and Lady LaSure. And if I wanted to get that info from them as well, um, I could. And it'll bring it back. And so now, that's pretty cool for, for just our users, but now we want to be able to add pets and get that association going as well. So I'm going to check out to step three. And inside of our schema, it's starting to get a little unruly here. We've got the user type still. Now I also have a pet type. Uh, and within the pet type, the top of it is going to be very similar, where we've got the stuff that already exists within that table in our database. But I want to associate owners and followers. So once again, using a resolver function, I actually go into my database using connects and grab all the owners, uh, all the users, I should say, that live in the pet owner's join table that are associated with that pet. And I do that by passing in this parent value dot ID. The resolve function takes a parent value or argument. So before we were passing in an argument from our query, now we're passing in the parent value. So it's once you've grabbed this pet, now in this resolver, uh, go do these things. So I've got that, and then I also created, I want to point out, uh, beyond followers, total followers. And the reason I did that, you might think, well, if I get that back, I can just assign that to dot length and just create that on the fly. But the beauty of GraphQL is that I should be able to get access to the total followers without requesting the actual followers. Maybe I just want to see the top 10 most followed pets, but I don't really need all the follower info associated with that. Great. So I have this very similar query. In fact, kind of breaking dry principles a little bit there because it's very much the same except for results.length. But I do that for a reason, just to make sure that those two types are in, or those two fields are independent. So if we want to dive into uh, querying a single user with their pets, we can do that. Similar syntax to what we had before, if I remember to copy and paste. There we go. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to refresh this again just because I want the Documentation Explorer to refresh with it. Cool. 
And so now, as I query single user with pets, uh, the documentation explorer, hold on, let's have it, there we go. When I query a single user, now it's aware of name, email, friends, pets owned, and pets followed. So if I do the same query now with both friends, uh, pets owned, and pets followed, I get back that LP not only has that list of friends, but he owns two pets, Uncle Johnny and Mrs. Meowmers, and he follows both of those pets as well as Frankie the French Bulldog and Gary the Leopard Gecko. Uh, so you can imagine if a user had logged in, this is a pretty useful query. It gives me a lot of information that I might need to associate with this user in just one request. Uh, if we want to see as well um, querying a single pet, now this time with the owners, the followers, and the total followers of that pet, we can do that. Dive in here. Once again, GraphQL, since I refreshed it, uh, does know about the pet type and the fields that I can query on that pet type. An ID of two should be uh, LP's cat, Mrs. Meowmers. Uh, it is. It's owned by Killer Mike and LP, followed by Killer Mike, LP, Childish Gambino, and Lady LaSure. And then our total followers is four. And again, to show the power of that, having that total followers field, just in case I need it, uh, I'm going to take out the followers part of the query, and it's still aware that the total followers is four. Sweet. Have I lost anyone at this point? I should have mentioned at some point that you could interject with questions, uh, but I think... Maybe we'll just uh, keep blazing ahead and see what you guys have at the end. Ooh, caps. So our final uh, resource that we need is uh, images. And in this branch, I've also decided to refactor schema. Before we were at, I think, 200 lines-ish, and we'd only created two types and one root query. And so I've decided now, let my schema just be concerned with creating this schema and passing in the fields that it needs. And I've created a types folder. So my pet type lives within there. Uh, my root query type also lives in there uh, because it is still an instance of a GraphQL object type. Uh, and then I have the new image type. Now, for images themselves, I actually never need to see the information associated with an image um, that's not already existing in the table. So this is a pretty simple type. But if I go back into my pet type, now that's been updated uh, to be able to take, let's see, yeah, I'm in my pet type. Uh, we've got a profile image. So instead of, I'm storing a profile image ID, so I'm accessing that in my parent value, but I actually want all of the stuff that is associated with an image. I want to be able to grab its URL, maybe the amount of likes, the captions that it has, stuff like that. And then within uh, images, very similar, I want an array of the images of that pet uh, and have access to the, all the fields within there. So if we want to take a look at what this query might look like, uh, we'll just grab all the images of a pet, because now I've established that in my uh, root query as well, that getting pet images lives in this field. So I'll refresh GraphQL one more time. This time I'm not passing in a query variable, so I'm just going to take that out. If GraphQL, let me. Cool. Pull that down. Uh, I'm just going to grab the uploaded at likes, caption, and image URL. Did I lose it? Hold up. Yeah? No? Yeah? Huh? Oh. Nothing. I swear to you. Hmm. That guy? Yeah? Hey. There we go. Whew. I mean, we hadn't even gotten to mutations, right? How crazy. Uh, don't worry. Michael on top of it, as well as you, sir, whose name I don't know. Uh, Austin. Yes. Shout out to Michael and Austin for fixing that. Yes. Uh, but cool. So I uh, made this pet images query, uh, grabbed the uploaded at likes, caption, and image URL, and now I've got access to all the different fields, um, or all the different pet images I have stored in my database. Now, I might even want to add queries of saying sort by likes, sort by uploaded at, depending on what my splash page needs. Right now, I'm going to let my client side handle that. Uh, and then, if we want to look at some other, uh, other potential queries, so a single pet with that pet's images, we can now access that. And we can see each image, and actually I'm going to grab its profile image as well, but I just want to make sure that the likes and the caption are the same. So let's try that. 
oops, I got to pass in a query variable, which it's letting me know that SQL was mad about that. So we'll just once again do an ID of two. Sweet. And so I've got, uh, looks like three, or let's see, two images from Mrs. Meowmers, and then her profile image is this one uh, with the caption, back when she was just a kitty. So that's how we can start grabbing uh, relational data, but what if I need to query two different types? We can definitely do that once, uh, and, and once we've got multiple types set up. Uh, within this, GraphQL, if it's a query and you're grabbing multiple types, it's going to run these in parallel, which is part of what makes GraphQL so performant, is that rather than um, just waiting on, let's see here, so I've got user happening after pet. So rather than waiting for the pet query to be done and then grabbing the user info, it's going to send both queries out at the same time and then uh, what it, whenever everything finishes, then it's going to serve up that data. So I'll keep pet ID of two. It's auto-completing for me. And let's just say user ID of, yeah, two as well, why not? So once again, I have all the same info on Mrs. Meowmers, but now if I drop below in the user key, I've got all of LP's information as well. Uh, but what if I want to grab two things of the same type at once? So instead of grabbing uh, a user and a pet, let's just grab uh, two pets, whoop, two pets, one query. Uh, so we'll do pet one ID. Sorry, that, that was a joke that I was hoping was just for me. I'm like, that's so dumb. Uh, and, then, and then it wasn't. It was for you good people as well, and I really appreciate that. Uh, cool. Let me just, I'm just going to copy down, because it's going to be the same query for these two different pets. And right now, you can see that graf Graphical's trying to help me with some syntax highlighting and letting me know, like, hey, right now, you told me pet one ID and pet two ID. Uh, this user ID has no business being here. And that's accurate. But now I want to grab two pets. So I've got these two queries set up the exact same way, grabbing the exact same fields. And uh, did I change? Oh, there we go. It's never used. Because I want an error here, but that's not the error that I want. I want this one. Uh, fields pet conflict because they have differing arguments, uh, use different aliases on the fields. So this is very similar to in SQL when we're doing some join queries. And we've got fields that are named the same, having to set up aliases. We'll have to do that here for GraphQL as well. Because it's running these queries in parallel, it doesn't know, does this pet ID belong to that first pet, that second pet, whatever. So to set up an alias, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're going to just say pet1, colon. Looks very similar to like C-sharp inheritance syntax. Uh, and then pet2. Sweet, now it's happy. And so you see it'll store everything inside of the alias's name as a key now. So pet one is going to be Mrs. Meowmers, and pet two is going to be Gary. And so that's all well and good, but at a certain point, we do want to start adding things into our database. So let's go to the next step here and create our first mutation. All right, so now I have not only just a uh, root query type, but I also, I like to call this file my root my great, uh, mutation type so that when I'm passing it into my schema, I just have similar naming conventions there just to let it know that this is the kind of parent object. But a mutation is really going to look very similar to a query. We can tell it uh, what type is going to get returned once we add this resource, uh, what arguments we should be able to pass into it. I'm now using the GraphQL non-null syntax to say that, hey, you can forget species, breed, and age if you're adding a pet, but I got to have a name to do it. Um, and then just a resolver function that lets it know how to add that new pet to the database and get that info back. So if I jump in, I did create a little API file with just some connects queries set up. Uh, I am returning everything from the pet object so that I can tell GraphQL what I might need on the fly from that. So if we want to just dive in and add a single pet, let's create Sparky the Goldfish. He seems cool. I won't need my query variables anymore because I'll pass these in as arguments when I do a mutation. Uh, so I give it the mutation's name, add pet, and then all the arguments go in, a, uh, in the parentheses rather than just putting them all on one line. I kind of like keeping it similar to object syntax. So I'm going to pass in uh, the name of Sparky, species of fish, goldfish, all that. Uh, and if I highlight the mutation name, it'll let me know that in add pet, 
I can pass in a string, and the, the exclamation point or bang at the end is telling me that has to be there, uh, and then species, breed, and age, and what those types are. So if I run this, we've got a new pet. Sparky the goldfish, his ID is nine. But what if we want to add two pets at once? Well, it's going to be, again, the same syntax as what we had in our query of getting uh, doing two things with the same type at once. Uh, we will need to use aliases. So for my add pet, I've got this called just with the pet's first name. So this is Lucille the dog and Barry the dog. Uh, but I'm requesting the same fields back from both. And we'll see now if for sure, if Lucille gets completed first or Barry gets completed first, if mutations also run in uh, parallel with each other. Cool. So we did get Lucille first and Barry first, but actually under the hood, uh, GraphQL is running these serially. So this is always going to happen. Uh, Lucille is going to always run first because we put her above Barry. And that's important to know because it's a big first step in a very important feature in GraphQL, which is the ability to cast return fields as variables. Right now, if I've got this pet, I cannot then go in and, based on that pet's ID, go add to, say, one of my join tables that takes a pet ID. I would have to make two different queries. And that's not really the point of GraphQL. I want to do everything in one query, one mutation. Uh, so for now, we have to create uh, a relational mutation to do that. And so we'll do that in our final step of the code here. Uh, we'll check out step six. Cool. Uh, the end of promise chains is not uh, near us anytime soon. As you can see with my add pet with owner and image, now I'm passing in owner ID and profile image URL as non-nullable because I know that I need those to go add owner info and image info. And then in my resolver function, I am having to promise chain down and touch all those different tables. So first I add an image so that I can get that image ID, pass it into my new pet as the profile image ID, and then I actually don't need, I already told this, uh, this mutation that I'm going to get a pet type back. So I don't really care. I don't have types set up for, for owners, followers, or uh, pet images that I'm going to need to um, go query directly like that. So instead, I am just going to uh, promise.all over those and just return my new pet. And I do that at index zero just because connects wraps everything in an array. Um, so if we go and check out what that looks like now, you can imagine in a normal application where we're doing that with uh, client-side queries, that's going to stack up to at least three different queries, maybe four, five, six, if we want to add uh, this cat named Queen to Kendrick Lamar's profile. Uh, let's just refresh one last time here. And now you see it's... Pretty big uh, mutation that we've got going here. I am passing in all the required uh, fields to set up this query, as it lets me know here. I need to have the owner ID, image URL, name, and then I've also added species, breed, and age. Uh, and getting back from that, I want to get everything that's associated with a pet. So actually, I'll open up the documentation info again. Um, and so everything for pet. I can query owners, followers, total followers, profile image, and images. Uh, I do want it to set up right now, at least for this mutation, that automatically when an owner adds a new pet, they follow them, and that the one image they add would be uh, their profile image. So if I query every single thing that I can associate with a pet with this mutation, I've got all the fields I need. I've got owners, uh, followers, total followers, the profile image, and uh, in that images array, I have that one image that we've passed in. Cool. So that's all the live code I've got for you guys uh, tonight. So now uh, we'll move into questions. And I do apologize. I talked a lot about pet pictures, but didn't show you one. So that's, that's why uh, these guys are going to be my uh, avatar for that. But I'm actually, I'm going to switch over to my contact info just because that's a distracting GIF. Uh, yes. They are always represented as a string on the client side, which is important. So if you're setting it up, I mean, especially using like Facebook stack, uh, you can do it with other things, but Facebook wants you to use you know, their own stuff. Uh, so if you're using like Apollo and, and React uh, on, on your client side, you're really using Apollo just to be able to format that string and send it up. Uh, that's what's actually, it is happening in the browser. Um, oh, let me just escape that. Uh, in, like it's starting to create all of that query string, but you can imagine just expecting your front-end dev to remember all of that, especially with all those, uh, you know, different special characters and stuff, 
that's annoying. And instead, you can just have this interpolated string inside of, say, React with Apollo and have it formatted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you're asking if I, if I want like dynamic queries that, that similar to, to like SQL queries where ands and ors and stuff are happening. Um, you, I, I mean, in, in a certain sense you are as far as like telling it what fields you want to query, um, but a lot of times you're going to see that actually come in with how you define that query. Um, so if I look at my root query, like I am using that for, for especially as I grab, uh, or actually that's going to live in the user type, I'm using some or syntax, yeah, so I'm using where, or where, uh, on, or on. Um, and I'm gonna have, like GraphQL just needs to know how do I get all this data and start manipulating it myself to serve it up to you. So unfortunately right now as far as giving it sort of optional things like that, um, I don't know of anything that really does that. You can sort of do similar things with fragments, but, but it's not, you're still gonna need to have a defined query type at some point. Um, and so while you don't have to request all those fields, like the way you resolve those fields needs to remain consistent for now, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So he asked, uh, how, how well does GraphQL scale, especially if you have a number of tables, a uh, number of different databases? So I think it sort of depends on, on what your situation is. It is still pretty new as much as 2015 is not the new new in terms of web development by any means, but people were a little bit hesitant about it, especially as we live in a REST world where the idea of many resources from a single endpoint just feels off. Um, so as far as seeing big scale companies using it outside of you know, the Facebooks and GitHubs of the world, uh, it, it, it still a little bit remains to be seen, but I would say uh, that, that overall, if you're good with your file structure organization and if you're smart about maybe using microservices, like if you are using two different databases, you may want to use GraphQL separately in those two things and can just call upon these two things uh, as you need them. But right now, I would say we're still figuring out how well it scales, but at least as far as Facebook tells us they're using it, they say they're using it quite a bit internally, um, which would indicate to me that it scales pretty decently because they've got a lot of big issues that way. But yeah, that, that's a great question because there's still a little bit to be determined in that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's take a look at, let's just take a look at our, our gross relational mutation, because that's probably a good example that way. Oh, those are my helpers. Yeah. Uh, sweet. So if we really step through this as far as, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. He asked, uh, <laughs> can, can we explain, or can I explain um, how it reduces or, or just show the way it reduces all those round trips that your client side makes to your API? So in something like this where I'm making a, uh, a relational post request, essentially, uh, so this would probably be, one, one query in and of itself from your client side. Get that new ID back. Now I can create my new pet. So I'll go execute this query. Then from there, I'm probably gonna still make these th three separate queries to different endpoints to be able to, to set up these relations. Um, so, so yeah, just within that, we've probably got five reduced down to one query. Um, and, and that's seen as well on like, like say the pet type where if I want images, granted, it's just going into pet images and then joining images, which I could set up in REST with like a query parameter as well. Uh, but it's still probably gonna be at least two requests to go grab uh, the pet info that lives inside the database and then, uh, then go grab the images info that lives inside a different table in the database. Did that kind of explain that? Yeah, yeah. So you had actually three separate instances of that. So I mean, it's basically doing the math. It's not too hard to do it, but you need to work on the client side and then you're able to make a call and you can do the option and create a file and you're good. I, I mean, I, I would say the whole idea behind implementing uh, GraphQL, okay, sorry, again, uh, <laughs> he asked, uh, how do I sum that up quickly? Um, like, just keep going, okay. Yeah, uh, I mean.
Yeah, I mean, that, that was a great, what's your name? Matt? Max with an X. Nice. Shout out to Max. That was a great explanation. But basically, so we're talking about, uh, he was asking, uh, so for, should I still do stuff like a get all request on users, those RESTful endpoints, uh, where it's slash this resource, get all those things, and then filter it on your client side? That might make sense, but I would just say that if you're already implementing GraphQL, the idea is that you set up all these different queries and all these different fields so that no matter what you need to do, uh, you are just making that one request. So, so there really shouldn't be that much filtering and data manipulation. And maybe that's even a sign if you're, if you're you know, working alone or even within a team on a project and you sh you're starting to go that way on the front end and you've got GraphQL at your disposal. Maybe you know, either yourself or if you've got it separated in front end teams and back end teams being like, hey, I really need this query uh, so that I'm not doing 12 different things for one request or to get one set of data for a view. Uh, but yeah, the whole idea being that, that uh, GraphQL, we're telling it where to resolve uh, the higher uh, level query kind of, 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 okay, this is our pet, so in, inside of that, you're gonna go grab pets, but then when, when we're getting into owners, images, uh, I'm adding those as kind of, you can sort of think of them as sub-queries, like it's very similar to, let's see, uh, yeah, I've even gotten here. So with my, a, as I was seeding my, my pets table, uh, for my profile image ID, rather than worry about my IDs getting out of sync as I did migrates, rollbacks, all that, uh, I just set that to a subquery in Connects and go grab that ID uh, by, by some unique, like here I knew as I was setting it up that image, image URL was going to be unique uh, and grabbing that ID. And so it's sort of similar that way where you're setting up, you're thinking about not just the overall resources that you need, but then the kind of the subqueries that you may need to, to get the info you want. Yeah. Yes. So I think if I'm getting this right, like, like by setting up a, a, a field with a resolve function inside of a type, are, are we getting away from the point of GraphQL where, where we're still going to hit the, the database multiple times to get this one type back? And I would say that is true, so it sort of just depends on, on what your situation is, and it's, it's sort of a, a lot of things in the GraphQL world, like you go on Stack Overflow, and it's like, it depends. That's the first thing you hear. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say that in general, uh, you, you are going to potentially be adding to, to calls to your database, uh, so it is certainly something to, to think about, but I think the bigger issue is probably resolving uh, those, those, you know, if you're making the request, like, those different endpoints, especially because our queries, at least, since they're running in, in parallel, uh, they're going to run faster than our client side doing a promise chain of multiple queries to get the data that it needs for a view. Um, so I haven't seen anyone really talk about that being a huge uh, performance issue with GraphQL as far as making multiple database calls, but I think it's a good thing to keep in mind, especially as we're still kind of figuring out uh, is there a, a ceiling on the scalability of GraphQL? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, I would need to grab the uh, the the actual link to it, but I to sort of get my feet wet with GraphQL, I did a Udemy course that, that was great as far as n not just spitting out code and expecting you to understand it, but really explaining with flowcharts and stepping it through. And within th that course that I did, you first set up a back end, then you set up a front end for a different project, and then finally you set up a full app together. So you can really see the flow all at once tonight. Uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I, didn't, I wanted to really just focus in on the back end, uh, but, but Looking at it on the client side as well, I think it's helpful to get the, the whole picture because a lot of the questions here tonight of like, like, all right, but is this really going to reduce requests that I need to make? And, and it's helpful to see that entire cycle happening. Whereas me just playing around in graphical, it's like, all right, cool, but did Facebook just make that tool like work super dope? And then once I set up my front end, it's not going to work at all, uh, which is not the case. It actually, it is like literally those, like if you passed in those queries as interpolated strings and had the right, you know, tool, like say you were using, you know, Apollo client to turn that into a query and attach it, um, it, it, it works just as fast as in graphical. Which, but yeah, uh, I, I like that. And also Apollo's blog is really good uh, as far as resources for, for learning GraphQL. Yeah, no, you're all good. Uh, 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So, uh, like, so when I was doing dates, um, or actually, I'll just show them the migration on that. Uh, where is images? Cool. So uh, I can create, w at least within connects, I can tell it that it'll be a timestamp, which returns a string. Um, and I want to say Postgres does have a date time field that I can pass through. It's been a second since I went bare metal on Postgres and did that, but I want to say there is a date time field that you can give it. Um, and really, the main reason I use timestamp and like using a timestamp string is because then I can use something like moment.js to be like, cool, here's how I want it displayed. Um, Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if I go if I go into my images type, ba -ba 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 -da, yeah, cool, yeah. Upload uploaded at is a string. Yep. Um, there there's a few extra types that I didn't get to really dive into. Like so, one thing that you would definitely use for auth or even for something like um, you know add pet with owner and image, you can create input types. So rather than uh, telling it about these fields individually, you just collect them all and say, hey, they have to input this. Um, and, and so that's kind of a nice way to even break it apart further and, and not have to have uh, any one file doing too many things. Uh, but yeah, as far as, as far as how I like to handle it, at least I just keep them as strings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, uh, I can actually probably pull it up. It's, that's a great question. So he asked if, if it's looking down below at like Postgres or MySQL, whatever it might be, and looking at those types and, in, and maybe not necessarily inheriting them, but, but going like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like saying like, oh, you have a daytime thing, so now I have a daytime thing. And actually, no. Uh, <laughs> GraphQL, um, it's a pretty limited list of types. Uh, there we go. Um, so there are a few extra things that I didn't talk about, but overall, I think they've got a list somewhere here. Yeah, I mean, mainly you're using int float string boolean, and, and you can do ID for like uh, UUIDs and stuff, because that, that stores it as a string instead of a, um, an int. Um, so that's, that's uh, that's yeah, I want to say, yeah. I think it stores it as a string, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could even query, let's see here. Uh, we can even take a look at what it, what it brings back. Uh, so let's just say images. Oh, man, I didn't command D that like a fool. All right. Uh, sweet. But I think you'll see that it, I want to say Postgres. Yeah, it stores them as a string if you use the, the timestamp. Oh, is it converted? Okay, cool, cool. Thank you for the alley oop there, uh, <laughs> CJ. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, it looks like, yeah, Connects is casting it as a string. Yeah, yeah. Cool, good question, though. Yeah. Sweet. Yes. Mm hmm. Oops. Ooh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like this one's yellow, this one's green. Yeah, oh man, lifesaver. Because uh, there's so many times, especially like in a gross promise chain when you're just deving and haven't refactored yet, where you're like, uh, where is everything? I, so I want to say that's Swackets. Let me double check, though. Um, uh, yeah. Swackets, yep. Color empowered brackets, yeah. Yeah, we all discovered, yeah, in G30, I think we discovered swackets all on the same day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Michael was like, no, for real, you guys need to learn Node Express. And we were like, no, for real, I need different colored curly braces, man. Like, this is important to me right now. Uh, we wasted a morning on it, but worth it, because now, now, full circle, here we are. I am at your meetup talking about swackets. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Anyone else have a question on my Atom packages before I remove settings? Yeah? Cool? Sweet. CDN libs is also a good one. Just automatically. Uh, yeah. Uh, start typing CDN, and then it'll auto-complete like jQuery. Cool. And it'll just grab the latest version of jQuery. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Uh, 
oh, yeah, that's lucid chart. Yeah, I like that. And I like doing that for, for something like this where I'm not going to be doing uh, like a really a true, we can dive back to that slide here, um, where I'm not going to be doing a true like, like schema where I'm showing the columns and stuff in there because I actually do really show, like showing these gradients so that it's like, no mistaking, if you didn't understand, because I didn't really truly say that pet followers was pet users, because I have two different ways to associate pets and users. Um, it's got some green, it's got some red. It's pets and users, yeah! Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like it for that. It also, it has built in all the different like ERD connection types, like even the more complex like zero or one to many, blah, 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 um, all those different ones beyond just one to many, many to many. Um, it's a cool tool, and also like, uh, it creates these like nodes on the side so that you're just like drag and drop attaching it. It's, it's useful, it's cool. I use Google Slides for my slides. Uh, that first image with the rock was all me. Uh, that's, that, that takes a lot of graphic design skills. I'm a five tool player, don't worry about it. Uh, anyways, yeah, sorry, <laughs> getting distracted. Anyways, yes, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, so I mean, you do want to give it a, a semantic name at the very least that's just letting, you know, the developer behind you or even the dev developer who is you but three months in the future and doesn't remember what you were doing. Uh, you want to give it some sort of semantic meaning here. Uh, typically, they are camel cased. Um, like, I, I haven't seen people doing uh, with their fields within their mutation uh, Pascal casing or anything like that. Um, and then as far as how you pass them into the schema, um, honestly, a lot of times I see this as, as just query um, or just mutation or mutations. I like saying root query and root mutation just to know that like these are buckets where you know all my mutations and queries live. Um, but, but I actually did some Googling on that to be like, GraphQL best practices, like what, what are the naming conventions here? And the answer is like, we're gonna find out uh, as you guys mess stuff up. And, and so that's kind of where I'm at. Like a lot of people have started using the root query one, but for whatever reason, uh, call that one mutations all in lowercase. And I'm like, that doesn't match. I actually was mid developing this. was like, why am I doing this? They, this should be root, root mutation. But I haven't found a great resource. Like there's nothing really in the GraphQL docs of like, this is how that has to be named. So I think the big thing is just giving the names of your field something semantic so that yourself or another developer can come in and be like, cool, add pet with owner and image means I'm adding a pet and the owner relationship and an image uh, all at once. Cool. Any other questions? Sweet. Uh, well, in that case, I just have one more gift. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs>